uh, as a former corporate executive, you know, he thrives on this level of chaos, really. I promised I would exit or renegotiate any deal which fails to serve America's interests. Many trade deals will soon be under renegotiation. Very rarely do we have a deal that works for this country, but they'll soon be under renegotiation. The process has begun from day one, but now we're down to business. Beyond the severe energy restrictions inflicted by the Paris Accord, it includes yet another scheme to redistribute wealth out of the United States through the so-called Green Climate Fund, nice name, which calls for developed countries to send $100 billion to developing countries, all on top of America's existing and massive foreign aid payments. So we're going to be paying billions and billions and billions of dollars. And we're already way ahead of anybody else. Many of the other countries haven't spent anything. And many of them will never pay one dime. The Green Fund would likely obligate the United States to commit potentially tens of billions of dollars, of which the United States has already handed over one billion dollars. Nobody else is even close. Most of them haven't even paid anything, including funds raided out of America's budget for the war against terrorism. That's where they came. Believe me, they didn't come from me. They came just before I came into office. Not good. And not good the way they took the money. In 2015, the United Nations, departing top climate officials, reportedly described the $100 billion per year as peanuts and stated that the $100 billion is the tail that wags the dog. In 2015, the Green Climate Fund's executive director reportedly stated that estimated funding needed would increase to $450 billion per year after 2020. And nobody even knows where the money is going to. Nobody's been able to say, where is it going to? Of course, the world's top polluters have no affirmative obligations under the Green Fund, which we terminate. America is $20 trillion in debt. Cash-strapped cities cannot hire enough police officers or fix vital infrastructure. Millions of our citizens are out of work. And yet, under the Paris Accord, Billions of dollars that ought to be invested right here in America will be sent to the very countries that have taken our factories and our jobs away from us. So think of that. There are serious legal and constitutional issues as well. That's right. Foreign leaders in Europe, Asia, and across the world should not have more to say with respect to the U.S. economy than our own citizens and their elected representatives. Thus, our withdrawal from the agreement represents a reassertion of America's sovereignty. What this is, rebirth. This is it, folks. We want fair treatment for its citizens, and we want fair treatment for our taxpayers. We don't want other leaders and other countries laughing at us anymore. And they won't be, they won't be. I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. Just saying that exposes the whole global system. 
it, it operates in secrecy. It operates in the public never hearing about it. Oh, Bilderberg's secret. Oh, TPP is being ratified the secret. Doesn't exist. Shut up, racist. Hey, Obamacare has death panels and doubles prices. Shut up, racist. Gruber goes on C-SPAN. Thank God the public's so dumb. It actually triples prices. <laughs> See, the whole thing counts on you not being engaged. But the minute their program's exposed, it's over. And then it starts manifesting people that were patriots all along, like Trump for 30, 40 years fighting globalism. His dad hated it. His lawyer hated it. James Leslie Rawls joins us. And then I'm going to open phones up towards the end of the hour. I've got some other clips I want to play. There's so much big news here. But Bilderberg's meeting trying to overthrow Trump. He's a best-selling author, top American uh, novelist and blogger, known for being a top survivalist, survivalblog.com, formerly Army Intelligence, really smart analyst, great guy. I wanted to just get him on today because uh, I you know, I don't talk to him off air. He's a busy guy. I'm a busy guy just to get his analysis to make sure I'm not off the, off the reservation here. But I am actually ashamed of myself that I haven't supported Trump even stronger when he goes a little bit sideways. What do we expect him to do? He's completely surrounded in a swamp. The, the killing TPP, the 49% the down and illegals coming across the border, the, the whole government in rebellion against him, all the fake leaks, uh, the economy surging back despite globalists wanting it to be in the tank by now, uh, the, 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 the good Supreme Court justice, the, the Second Amendment coming back. I mean, uh, the carbon tax is killed. I mean, this is just fabulous, and it's real. And meanwhile, they have gone into hissy fits everywhere saying, kill him, kill him now. My big question is, what does he think of Trump now, and what does he think the enemy's going to do? Because this has now reached... America's gaining more ground back the last 130 days or however long Trump's been in. How long has it been since January 20th? 130 days, something like that. In the last 130 days, we've gained back more ground for sovereignty than the last 60 years we lost. I mean, this is epic. And I know it's not just Trump. A lot of the intelligence agencies are patriots. A lot of the people in there knew finally how bad it was because Ron Paul and everybody else and Wesley Rawls and Drudge and so many others exposed it. We got called kooks. When it all came out in the open, we were right. People actually made the right decision and said, you know what? They were right. Screw this. I, I think we've reached that moment. But then let's not start getting euphoric. False flags. I smell them. I mean, what are they going to do to pull their bacon out? Because as Soros said in the, in the London Independent and in Der Spiegel yesterday, he said, world government's collapsing. Globalism is in an existential threat. We've got to fight back. And their answer is shut us down all the rest. It's, it's not working, though. But the point is, we're in a battle. Uh, James Wesley Rawls, what do you think? I have to agree with you. I, I think the globalists are in a, a downright panic right now because for the first time in I don't know how long, we have a president who's actually keeping the promises he made on a campaign trail. And first and foremost of those was to reassert American sovereignty. And to to the globalists, that's, that's like someone approaching a, a vampire with, you know, garlic and holy water and, and a silver cross in their hand. They don't want to see that. And they'll, they are in panic mode. And that's why they are in an uh, all out effort. Can you feel the energy level as well? Not just intellectually. Can you feel it, James? Oh, yes, absolutely. It's it's palpable that the the mass media is willingly and enthusiastically going after Trump because they see him as a, a huge threat because he stands for everything that Hillary Clinton didn't stand for. And just rhetorically doing it is powerful, but he's actually delivering. I, I, I can't believe it's this real. Can you? Uh, no, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that he's been able to implement as much of his agenda as he has. It's, it's disappointing to see that the courts haven't gone along with him on, uh, on vetting uh, immigrants. Oh, the State Department's just ignoring him. They're just ignoring him. Yeah. Well, it, he's still, uh, from the executive branch, able to accomplish a lot. He's pushing as hard as he can. Unfortunately, he does not have the full cooperation of Paul Ryan and the rhinos in Congress. Exactly. But bottom line, I'm not just cheerleading. It's true. He is fighting like a mad devil, basically. I mean, he is throwing everything he's got against him. I just hope he's got the stamina, but he seems to be thriving off of it. Oh, he does. Uh, he, you know, he, uh, as a former corporate executive, thrives on this level of uh, chaos, really. It's, it's, a, it's a very energizing battlefield that he's on. And 
I'm hopeful, in fact, I'm in prayer that he's able to keep up this pace all through his first term. That's right. I know yeah. Trump, from people that know him, has always believed in God. He just hates fake preachers. But he's had a lot of new, more intense spiritual experiences now, and that's why he's calling on God. His wife's calling on God. Trump has really changed. And there's no doubt now, Trump is clearly anointed to take on the Antichrist system. Even if he fails down the road, I see it as a precursor to larger battles to come. I mean, I think we're seeing biblical prophecy right now. Oh, I think you're right. Uh, the the signs that we're living in the end times are are increasing every day. Now it was a little disappointing. Speaking of end times, to see that uh, he backpedaled a bit on his promise to relocate the U.S. embassy for Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But the good news is he's promised to revisit that once every six months. And apparently, in his face-to-face -face meeting with a boss, he actually shouted at a boss. And that's the only time I've ever seen a report of Trump shouting at anyone since he's been in office. So uh, it's obvious. Well, it goes on behind the scenes privately quite a bit, but yeah. Yeah, it's obvious he's a friend of Israel. And I hope that he doesn't have to make too many compromises when it comes to Middle East peace. Well, he's reportedly has pressed things to the breaking point. Apparently, yes. And uh, again, I'm very encouraged overall with progress I've seen the Trump administration make. And while the mass media has been able to drum out a, a few uh, folks from the Trump administration, the majority of them are sticking in there. You know, we've got St uh, Steve Bannon and Kellyanne Conway who are hanging in there. Sure. Think of the pressure they're under. Think about micro too, folks, and pray for them. Because this is this is not this is not a game.